There's a quote I want to begin with today from David Gibbons. I don't know if you know who that is, um, but it doesn't matter. What he said is the true test of your spirituality, or I would say the true test of your relationship with the Lord, is your relationships. So the true test of your spirituality is your relationships. It's not what you say. It's not your talk. It's not the words that are coming out of our mouth. It's how we're living that out in our relationships. And so with that, let's go into James. I love the fact that here at the Ocean this year, we've been reading through the whole Bible. And this week, I wanted to make sure I was on the same page with you guys. So earlier this week, I read through Philemon, Philemon, Philemon. Depends on who you ask, maybe. I do teach English, yeah. Um, and Hebrews and James. And at the end of reading through those, I got to the end of James. And, I mean, we could have talked about several passages today and talked about the same topic. But at the end of James, let's look at that. At the end of James, chapter 5, I want to just read some verses and we'll see what we notice, okay? So James 5, verses 14... Uh, I'll just start in verse 14. Is, any, is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, Confess your sins one to another and pray for another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. My brethren, this is now jumping to verse 19. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So, here's what I noticed. I read through this. Here's what I noticed. So, verse 14, is anyone sick? Call for the elders. Okay, so calling elders. Okay, one thing. Verse 15, the prayer offered for another person. They're offering, they're praying for someone else will heal the sick. And then we go to verse 16, confessing your sins. Now, confessing, you're confessing to someone. And then that leads to someone being healed. In verses 19 and 20, you have someone leaving and someone turning them back to come back into the fellowship, to come back into relationship with the Lord. So what I'm noticing, what I'm trying to point out here is all of these things require other people. You know, if you're calling the elders and that, that requires someone to call, right? There has to be someone called an elder. If you're praying for someone else, there has to be someone else. And if you are confessing, unless we're talking about talking to ourselves, which maybe you want to count that, but ignoring that, if you don't want to just talk to yourself and be strange, there has to be someone else. And if someone is walking away and there's someone else to turn them back, there has to be someone else. We have to be in relationship for any of these things to make any sense. And on, on those last two verses again, they're on the screen right now. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save them from death. I heard it said once, I think this might be in the notes, that you must have someone in your life who you trust more than you trust yourself. The reason being, the nature of deception is that you don't believe you are deceived. So if you ever got to the place where you were deceived about what was true, what was right, what was wrong, who is God, who are you, if you ever got to that place and there was no one in your life that you trusted more than you trusted yourself, you can never leave that place because there's no one you will listen to to realize that you're deceived. Does that make sense? And so for that to happen, you have to be in community. You have to be in relationship. And that's, that's the point I'm going towards this morning. Connection, love. I love that your three C's, it talks about it. Community, even culture creating, even Christ-centered. It's all about connection, us being together, this being a family, this being, in the words of Christ, a body of believers. 
And that's who we are this morning. And walking around, I, Peter, are you here? Or one of them? There's like 17 Peters in this group, which I think is awesome, because I'm Peter. And so I feel at home here. I didn't talk to you during coffee. I'm sorry, man. We'll have to talk later. Um, but out of that coffee, I was just watching and seeing people talking to each other and loving on each other. And the story uh, my sister shared earlier about going and visiting and, and that, that bonding together, that being a part of one another, that's that connection. And I've heard it said that God will not give you everything you need in life directly to you, okay? He'll give you everything that you need in life, but he won't give all of that directly to you. Why? Because if he, gave every, if he provided everything directly to you, then we would end up isolating ourselves to this singular relationship, us and the Lord, and we would cut off every other person. Because let's be honest, sometimes relationship with people is difficult. Not for you. I'm sure there's no one in your life that's ever been difficult to deal with, that you've ever... Okay, but you know a friend, so take notes for your friend. Uh, so we would do that, though. I know I would probably do that that we would create this isolated environment, this kingdom of us and the Lord. And the problem with that is that we are called to be salt and light in the world, not isolated from the world. And so God's got this point of connection, create um, connection and community that he's wanting us to be an example of, a model of, a picture of. And that's... Um, what Jesus himself in John chapter 13 uh, talks about. He, he brings his group together. He paused one afternoon. He had the, he had the crew together, the disciples. And he pauses and he looks at them and he tells them this. He tells them, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And then he says this, just as I, just as I have loved you, so love one another. And that the world, the world by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world will know that you are my disciples, that you are, are my followers, that you are a part of me because of how you love another, one another. And so he's connecting our very essence, who we are as believers, who we are as the body, who we are as... Um, followers of Christ, to being connected, to being in relationship, to being loving, to having love, showing love, living in that. And this is something that I believe James talked about earlier in his message to us. So if you want to turn to James chapter 2, the beginning of James chapter 2, he's talking in the context of relationship. They had an issue, they had a problem in their community where people were being judgmental, they were being prejudiced, they were being, um, they were showing favoritism, showing favor to one person and judging another. And James had a problem with this because it was revealing the quality and the nature of their love. And so he comes to them and he tells them, when we get to verse 14, so that's the context, and then we get to verse 14 and he says, what good is it? my brothers. If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or da and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And then if you went to the end of that chapter, in verse 26, it says, For the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead, or faith without deeds is dead. And so, here's my thought. Love looks like something. Love looks like something. Faith without works is dead. Love without reality, love without something, it being something doesn't exist. James is saying just like 
You can say you have faith. You can be living in, do you know, quote unquote, faith. But if there's no evidence of it, if there's no fruit of it, just like a, a mango tree produces mangoes, if it isn't producing mangoes, it's not really a mango tree, James is saying. If your faith isn't showing anything, it's not really faith. If your love doesn't look like something, then it's not really love. There was a song in the early 1990s. I'm old. I'm not really old. I'm young. Sorry, I realize that maybe that. <laughs> Anyways, if you're young and you say you're old, maybe someone that's a year older than me would be offended. I'm not trying to offend anyone. Now I'm offending more people by trying to explain myself. So rewind, delete that from the video, and we'll start over. Um, but there was a song in 1990-something by this group called DC Talk. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. Um, I'm not going to sing it for you. I'm sorry. I'm not going to actually rap it for you. But the title is Love is a Verb. I said love because it's L-U-V. They're all kind of hip and gangsterish. Um, so L-U-V is a verb. And the whole song is just that point, basically, that love looks like something. Love is an action. It's a verb. It's not a description of something. It's an action. Maybe our friends down here can play it for us afterwards, but, or I can try and beatbox it. I don't know. Or maybe Victor. Victor, do you beatbox? Like, make hip-hop beats? I don't know. I'll dance if you want to beatbox later. Um, but love is not effective. It's not, it has no point as an idea alone. It fails as an idea. It is amazing as an action that is lived out in reality. To paraphrase Steven Pinker, a, a, an author and psychologist, he says, words in our vocabulary only carry meaning by their connection to a past experience. What does that mean? You understand what I mean if I describe something as being wet, right? That. I sat down on my seat and it was wet. You, you understand what I mean, why? Because you've touched water on a surface. You've felt cloth that was soaked. There's an experience that you remember. You understand the meaning of the word chaos by experience. The, I teach English, okay? So I have a whole bunch of opportunity to try and describe uh, the meaning of English vocabulary to my students. And some of it, it's really easy. I've got this down, like car. I just point out the windows, like that. That's, that's a car, okay? Or an apple, or a mango. You just show them one, and they understand that. It gets a little bit more difficult when you try and describe the definition of justice. Or if you try and explain something weird that English-speaking people say, like, Couch potato. He's a couch potato. What does that mean, teacher? I don't understand. Um, someone who watches TV all day. Um, let me just try and explain that more. Uh, so how do you describe, though, think about this. How would you describe love? How would you describe peace to someone? How would you describe, in words alone, joy? Those are experiential words. You have to, you know peace because you've experienced it. If, if you've never experienced peace, my words can't give you that feeling. I, there has to be some experience that you are connecting that meaning to. It's the same with love. World-changing love is not the kind that can exist in words only. It, it can't exist intellectually. It must exist experientially. So back to love. English is weird. Can we all agree with that? I tell my English class sometimes, if we get to something difficult, I say, but remember, English is easy. And I thought they understood sarcasm until about the fifth week of the class when someone raised their hand and said, teacher, we don't think it's easy. What do you mean? So I had to explain sarcasm. Um, so sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes it's just strange. For example, I would say I love my mother. I would certainly say I love my wife. I would also say I love pineapple. I would say I love naps. 
that's weird, like naps, my wife, that something needs to be different there, but we use the same word. So we're talking about love. I'm trying to encourage us in love, but what does that mean? Let's, I have six thoughts, six ideas. This is not the definition of love, but six ideas that I want you to consider today about love. What does love look like? So I said it this way. Love says these six things and others. But today, love says, I will affirm you. I will encourage you. I will support you. I will affirm who you are as a person. I will believe in you, number one. Number two, I will be available to you and your needs. If you are hurting, I am available to you. I give you the right to, to draw from my strength to support your weakness. I will be there for you. I will pray for you. I will pray for your needs. I will pray for your dreams. Let's not just focus on what's wrong. Let's focus on where we're going. I will pray for you. Number four, I will be open and honest in communicating with you, to you. So love says, number five, I will be trustworthy. If I'm in a loving relationship with you, my love is saying to you, I will be trustworthy. We are saying that to each other. We will be trustworthy. I will steward. I will protect. I will, I will take care of the, the trust that you have entrusted to me, the, the things in your life that you have shown me. I will, I will protect. I will take care of you. Love says, number six, that I will practice accountability. I will seek to see you realize everything that God has put in you. Now, accountability maybe needs another description. I believe accountability is one small part helping people stay away from or stop sinning. Does that make sense? That's normally how I hear people talk about accountability. I need to stop doing this in my life. Please hold me accountable. I believe it's one small part of that and one giant heaping portion. If it was food on a plate, it'd be a mountain that's like, a meter high. I don't know if that's actually possible. Um, but a giant portion of asking these two questions. What is your destiny? What has God put inside of you and in front of you? And what are you doing about it? God is calling you as a person. It says um, many places in the word, it talks about how the Lord has created us, crafted us. He's put something before us and within us that we are invited to step into to pursue and so what is that for you and what are you doing about it? i want to see you get there and i want to be a part of that so love says those things i will affirm you i will be available to you i will pray for you i will be open and honest in communicating with you i will be trustworthy and i will practice accountability and a million other things but those are six thoughts today so think about those but Here's the next thing. What about Steve? You know, Steve, the guy who's strange, who um, doesn't like me, who says mean things about me, or is just weird. Maybe I just don't like Steve. I'm sorry if there's anyone. Actually, I met a guy named Steven here today. I'm sorry, Steven. I'm not talking about you. I just need a name, so I picked Steve. So Steve is that imaginary person that your friend has who your friend doesn't like right? Because we all love everyone. And so Steve is that difficult person. What about Steve? Am I supposed to be showing affirmation and encouragement to Steve? Am I supposed to be practicing trustworthiness with Steve? Am, am I supposed to be available to Steve? I don't even like Steve. But Jesus, in, in chapter 13 of John, where we read him telling his disciples, they will know you by your love. Let's pause. Who is he talking to? Let's remember this. He's talking to a group of people who do not um, give us a picture of perfect harmony. They are not a perfect family. I mean, for one thing, you have a tax collector, Matthew, and a zealot. Simon the Zealot, he was called. So basically, we have two political factions who the political parties hate each other. 
the tax collector basically is cooperating with the oppressive government of the Romans. The zealot wants to revolt against the Romans. So you put those two in a group and they're supposed to love each other? What about um, all these illustrations we have about the disciples? You remember reading it in the last couple months. They're always arguing about who's the greatest. And then you even have James and John who got their mother involved, which is, hey, mom, why don't you come ask Jesus if we can be number one and number two? That'd be great, right? And then all the other disciples get mad. <clears throat> why did they get mad? I, what if they were actually not mad that they did it, but they were mad because the idea was so brilliant and they didn't think of it first, right? And so they're arguing about who's the greatest. They're, they're arguing maybe about politics. We don't, we don't know. Um, and then you have this one incident where they get in a boat. They even argue about chores, right? So they get in this boat. They're going on a journey, and they're going 13 men, right? Mind you, it's 12 disciples, Jesus, 13 people, maybe others, and they're men. Men like to eat. So they're in a boat going across a long journey. I don't know how many hours, but it was, that, it was a long journey. And as they're going, Jesus looks over or looks forward back. I'm not sure where he was sitting in the boat. It doesn't matter. So he looks over and he says, um, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Well, yeast, use yeast to make bread. And so someone apparently was hungry already because they heard that and they started thinking, oh, wait, he must be talking about bread. Where is the bread? I want bread. Wait, no one brought any bread. So they start fighting over who was supposed to bring the bread. So they're not a perfect family. But even in that context, those are the people Jesus was talking to when he said, love one another. And so even imperfect people. But even further than that, because in 1 John, it says because that we love because Christ first loved us. And in Matthew chapter 5, Christ commands us to love our enemies. Now that's your enemies. That's Steve just is weird, but... Your enemies? And if you remember from a couple months ago, the book of Daniel, in Daniel, we have this guy, this kid. He's living life. We don't know how old he was, but he's living in Israel. And an invading army comes in. They sweep in. They destroy cities. They destroy the fields. They destroy everything. They kill thousands of people. They kill the army. They kill, they probably leave Daniel as an orphan before slapping chains on his wrist and taking him off to a foreign land to become a slave. I mean, Daniel lives through this invasion of horror, and he finds himself living in the palace of the king who ordered all of that crafted this new reality that he's sitting in. And so years later, when Daniel walks into the hall of that very king, being asked to interpret a dream for him, a dream that speaks judgment and punishment upon that king, his enemy, I think we would all understand if Daniel was maybe glad or maybe excited or maybe even would point a finger and say, King, this is exactly what was coming to you. This is what you deserve. This is justice. You are going to be punished for what you've done to me, to my family, to my nation. All that destruction, this is what is coming to you now. But Daniel doesn't do that. He looks at this guy who many of us would consider to be an enemy and in Daniel chapter 4, verse 19, he looks at him and he says, um, so 19, then Daniel, also called, I can't pronounce that, Belshazzar, there we go, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. And he answered, my Lord, Listen to this. My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. He is looking at this man who has destroyed his life and says, I don't wish judgment upon you. I love you. I, I want good things for you. 
And it's through that example he's living for us that, that the Lord turns the course of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Yes, he goes through in the rest of that chapter, he goes through this judgment, he goes through this punishment, but through that, and in part through the, the witness and the testimony of Daniel's love for him, we read at the end of that chapter in verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is that king talking, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. He connects with God. Daniel's love was part of that turning in an evil king's life. And so the people we love, the people who are weird, the people who hate us, our enemies, the question is not if we should love, the question is how. It's, the question is what does that love look like? And I'm, I'm standing here this morning and I, I wrestled with a question, a thought. Because when you walk into a place you're, you're not that familiar with, but if you walk into a family where everything I have seen, everything that I know says that you love well, when, when I am standing here talking to you about love and I'm thinking in my mind, this is a group that loves each other. They love their fellows here. They love the people, to my knowledge, around them in the world. Lord, why, why am I telling them, why am I challenging them to increase, to go to another level in loving each other when they already love well? Do you understand my, that was my wrestling match when I was looking at this, but this is what I felt like the Lord showed me, told me. This is why I feel like he is speaking this to us today. We are called the ocean, right? And if, if you want to travel on water, say you want to cross a river, you need a way of doing it. We generally call it a boat. You need a boat. So your boat or your ship goes across a river. You need a certain size boat to be able to go across a river. You need a larger boat to go across Lake Victoria or Lake Tanganyika. You need a larger boat still to cross the channel to Zanzibar or an even larger one if you wish to travel to India, Australia, Indonesia. That makes sense. So the size of your boat determines the size of the seas you can sail upon. It determines the opportunities. It determines the, the things that are open to you, the things that are happening. Okay. The size of the anchor for your boat determines the size of the storms that you can steady that boat in. If you have an ocean liner to sail to Indonesia with, and you have a little anchor for a fishing boat, you're not going to be able to do anything if a storm comes. You, you cannot hold yourself fast. You're going to be tossed around by every wave that ever comes, by every situation that comes. Even though you have that big boat, you actually can't sail across oceans because you don't have the anchor. The anchor determines the size of storm that that boat can survive in. And love, I feel, is an anchor. And in the words of John Wooden, uh, a, a sports coach from America, he said, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. When the opportunity is here, when you need something, it is too late to go and get it. You need it now. And so what I feel the message is this morning is for this to grow, the ocean, this family to grow, to step into what is coming next, what the doors are being opened to step into, you have a new pastor coming. You have new opportunities every day that the Lord is inviting you to be a part of what he is doing in this, in this huge city. Dar Salaam, like, overwhelms me coming from the island, I got to tell you. And God is doing amazing things here, and he wants you to be a part of it. And so to step into a greater level of that, I believe he's asking us first to step into a greater level of love that the anchor would increase, that the ship may increase, that the opportunities for us to see great things here in this family will increase. And so my question is, what 
does our love look like? What does it look like for you in this family? What does it look like for you outside the walls of the theater here? I imagine that, that like me, you probably see certain people every week, probably like 50 of them, if we really thought about it, probably more than that. And so let's, if you will humor me, let's try something for a moment. If you would, if you want to close your eyes, think about this. If you want to just think about it, find someone in your memory that you encounter every week. Someone, let's, for the sake of argument, find, think of someone who is not a follower of Christ. Someone you know. Maybe it's the security guard outside your workplace. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's the cashier at a store that you go to every day. I don't know. But think of someone, someone you see every week. And then let's ask ourselves the question, how do they know that I love them? I mean, who is this person? Why do they know you? How do they know you? What is that relationship like? Where do you see them? What is their name? And how do they know that you love them? How do they know that Christ loves them? We're his representatives here. We are his mouthpieces. We are his body for him to show the world his love. How do they know? How does that person know that through your life? If you've heard the quote, there's a quote that says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I heard one better. A friend of mine, Anthony Lau, he once said, you can offer a man food, but you can't make him hungry. How do you make someone hungry? How do we stir desire in someone for Jesus? It's experiencing his love. It's experiencing his presence in your life that makes you desire more of him. And we are the opportunity for people to experience his love. I have a friend who a couple of weeks ago in a conversation mentioned to me that if there was one thing in this whole world that he could change right now, if he was given that power to change one thing about the whole world right now, he would eliminate life after death. He said he would eliminate eternity because he's freaked out. He's scared of what comes next. He has faith. He, he doesn't know Christ. He doesn't follow the Lord, but he's devout in his faith. But he knows no peace. He knows no love of Christ. He knows no hope. And if he could change one thing, he would eliminate life after death because he's afraid of it. And my question for myself this morning is what am I doing to change that? How is my love connecting to his life? What does that look like? What is its substance that he can see Christ in me, that he can see hope, that he can see life, that he can see a future, that he can connect with this love that so many of us in this room know that we have experienced in Christ? And if that was your friend and you have others, what's that answer for you this morning? And so I have like five minutes left, maybe, if Victor told me right. We go till one o'clock, right? No? <laughs> That'll be the beatbox party. But I realize that it can feel like... Um, As I thought about this yesterday, I realized that I was starting to feel overwhelmed, maybe. I was like, God, there's so many people in my life that I am not showing them your love like I should. Like, I feel inadequate. I feel, I start feeling um, down, if that makes sense. And that is not the message that I feel the Lord wants us to hear this morning. It's encouragement. And, and, if you read Hebrews this week, like many of us did, if we want to turn to chapter 11 in Hebrews, I want to finish with this, because this is a message of encouragement this morning, because this opportunity, this chance that we have to love people, 
is only a chance because God has given it to us. And I want to show you something about that that is in the Hebrews chapter 11. So if you turn there, I'm, for the sake of time, not going to read a whole lot. But verse chapter 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him, must, they must believe two things. What are the two things? Must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Okay, so remember those two things. Must believe he exists, must believe he rewards those who seek him. Okay? So the whole chapter, if you remember reading it, is called the, the faith chapter or the hall of faith, like the hall of fame of faith. Okay, because it's all these stories of people who throughout the whole of Scripture did all these things. They, they stepped out in faith, like Abraham. If you remember Moses, he's in there. All these people who did amazing things. And we get down to the end of the chapter, and, and remember, they're doing these, all these things for two reasons. They believe God exists. They believe God rewards those who seek him. Therefore, all these stories happened. And then, verse 39, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had, wait a second, did you read 39, and did that sound right? Remember, they did these because they believe God exists. They believe God rewards them. Okay, God cannot lie. It says in Scripture, God cannot lie. And so they do these things. And then verse 39 says, all these, though commended through their faith, God was like, congratulations, this is awesome. They did not receive what was promised to them. Did you pause there and ask yourself why? I think I did. Because then verse 40, though, this continues. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And chapter 12 begins this way. Therefore, because of that, because they have not received their reward, because they have not yet received what has been promised, therefore, because of that, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who are the witnesses? Those people who have not yet received their reward, they have not yet received what has been promised. They're watching. Since that great cloud of witnesses is surrounding us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Have you ever watched the Olympics? Anyone? You can raise your hand. It's okay. Okay, so you've watched, have you ever seen uh, a relay race? Okay, so normal race, you just run around in a big circle. I always thought that was kind of pointless. I didn't like running for, for just run, the sake of running. Um, but my wife does, so don't be offended, please. Um, so a relay race, you run around, and then you hand off a baton, and someone else keeps running, and then they hand off a baton, and they keep running. I like that idea because I only have to run like one-fourth of the race. And so in a relay race, if you're watching, you can watch one team, and they're in front. They're leading. And maybe the second person is running, and, and they're in front. Go Tanzania or wherever you're from. Um, they're winning. But if you pause the race right there, no one is going to receive a medal for who is in front after the second runner. No one receives a prize for being in front after the third runner. Whoever is in first place after the third runner, it doesn't matter. No one receives a prize. No one receives a reward until the last runner finishes, until the race is over, until the final runner has finished. No one receives their reward. We're in a relay race. If you look across all of time, all of Scripture, all these people have run. They've, they've done so much with what the Lord has put before them to do. And the Lord has said, not yet. There's more. I can keep greater and greater reward upon all these people because there's more and the race still isn't done and i believe we are among those people who have been called who have been asked who have been invited to be that last runner we are in the final stage i don't know how long that is but we are in the final stage and if you see the point this morning i don't 
care what you think about yourself, if you think you have no opportunity to change history, if you, have, if you think of yourself that you have no chance to change the person, or not to change, but to, to, to bring the love of Christ to the person you live next to, your neighbor, your coworker, if, if you believe you are insignificant, that you don't matter, well, apparently God thinks you matter. Because it was God, in the words of Robert Connor, who looked across all of history. He saw today. He looked at its challenges, its opportunities, all everything about today. And he looked at you. And he chose you to go here. He chose you to live here now. He chose you to have this opportunity. He chose you. So apparently, apparently God thinks that much of you. He thinks that much of us. He's put this before us, to love well. He's put that before us to, to finish well. He's put that before us because he believes in us. And so we're standing, we're sitting, I'm standing, my friend is standing. But we're here this morning with an opportunity, I believe, an invitation from the Lord to go to, in the words of a friend of mine in America, to go to the next level, to go higher, or to go deeper, whatever the metaphor you want to use, to go further, to increase in our love, because there is more that the Lord wants to accomplish here. Amen? I think that's awesome. We have an opportunity to be God's hand at work in Dar Salaam, in the peninsula, in your life. There's a world outside this theater that needs to encounter Christ, that needs to encounter his love. And that love looks like something. What's it look like in your life today? What will it look like this afternoon? What will it look like the next time you see Steve or the next time you see your coworker? What's it going to look like? Let's, let's go somewhere with it. And I'm excited to hear the stories of what is happening here in the next few months, in the next few years, to be a part of it, to hear from you, what is the Lord doing? to ask the question, what is the destiny of this family and what are we all doing about it? Amen? So, questions. Um, I don't know if you have those questions still. If you want to put those up. I think this week in expo groups, and if you're not an expo group, I think that would be an awesome thing to join. Awesome. There. I need to get like an Australian or British accent or something. So I can say awesome, like, and it'll sound awesome. Um, but I think it would be awesome if you all were in an expo group. And in expo groups this week, I would, if you would, if you want to, talk about these. How does that look in your life? How does affirmation look like in your expo group? What does it look like for you to be trustworthy, to be in accountability? What does it look like for you to be available to the people God has connected you to? What's this all look like? And how can we grow? How can we grow? That's the question. And so I want to pray for you this morning. I think you guys are awesome. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for, for welcoming me and my wife and my soon-to-be-born child that you didn't even know you were welcoming um, to be a part of this family this morning. Um, but I want to pray for you before I ask Victor to come back up. And so if you would just bow your heads with me. Father God, I just thank you that you, that you love us. God, you, you did not need to come for me. You do not need to come for us. But you sent your son to die for us, that you can restore our relationship with you. And God, this morning I ask for every person here that they would encounter your love. Because, God, it is only to the degree that we behold you that we are able to reflect you. Only to the degree that we understand your love experientially can we show that love to the world around us experientially. So, God, I ask that intensely for every person here that they will experience your love today. That you would reveal yourself to them through people, through circumstance through opportunity, through everything that they go through today. May your love speak through the fog to them. May they connect with you. May you connect with them. And God, I pray that as we walk through tomorrow, through this afternoon, through life, that we would see 
everything that you put in front of us, every opportunity and chance to love people. God, help us to to show you well, to love well. And may the ocean see a new level in everything you're doing, Lord. Amen. Thank you.